Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this workshop on modeling individuals without data via secondary test transfer learning method with Matthew Gosdial, who is an assistant professor in the computing science department at the University of Alberta and a Canadian CIFAR AI chair at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. He's the recipient of an early career research award from NSERC, a Unity Graduate Fellowship and two best conference paper awards. His work has been featured in the BBC, Wired, Popular Science and Time. My name is Maria, your MC, and just before you begin, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat with a question in front so the facilitator can identify them. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Maria. And I think we should be good to go. Um, so, as Maria mentioned, my name is Matthew Guzdile. I'll be presenting this talk on modeling individuals uh, without data using a secondary task transfer learning method. I remember the L this time, but I forgot the S in individuals. That's a shame. Um, I am a assistant professor at the University of Alberta. Uh, I am an Amy Fellow at the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, and I run the Grow Lab, um, which is at both organizations. So uh, this work that's sort of making up this workshop is all coming from a recently accepted chapter in an upcoming Springer book called uh, On Federated and Transfer Learning. Um, it was a project, which was a, a MyTox project where our partner was Service Credit Union. And the entirety of the work, essentially, I mean, I'm just the advisor, uh, but the entirety of the work was by Anmol Mahajan. Uh, he is a recent master's graduate, he graduated in the summer. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into it. So here's the problem. Here's the problem that we were interested in solving. Um, how can we go ahead and predict how someone will act in a different phase of their life? So let's say that we have some amount of information, some amount of data about a person in some initial phase of their life. And down the line, they enter a different phase of their life. What do we do about that? How can we predict what they're going to be like, what they're going to act like, et cetera? Now, if I say something like that, like prediction and data and words like this, you're probably thinking about uh, machine learning. But here's a twist. Uh, we have no data on these individuals for the second phase. I, I should note real quick before I get too much further, I'm going to use the phrases, uh, the phrase phase, <laughs> it's a bit confusing, um, just because the work that we did with Service Credit Union is still under NDA, so I'm not going to be able to get into specifics. So I'm just going to talk about two different phases generally. So, okay, we have no data. What do we do about that? Well, if you know anything about modern machine learning, you probably are thinking, wow, okay, well, Machine learning definitely has to be able to solve this somehow, right? Um, though maybe if you know a thing about machine learning and you know that you don't have data, things might get a little bit more confusing. So it, while it's definitely true that machine learning can do all sorts of really incredible things, you might be familiar with like this person does not exist and other examples of like GAN generated faces look really, really good. When cases where we have less data, such as like this watch GAN example, things get a little bit worse, or when we have even less data and higher variability, like this Christmas scan example, things can get downright bad. Uh, and so in the cases where we have absolutely no data, we need to get a little bit more creative. And speaking of creativity, uh, we'll get to that in a second. Let's start with desired properties of machine learning. So in an ideal sense, I think, we'd love for machine learning to be able to learn well from small amounts of data, and we'd love it to be able to handle novelty and surprise, both the input and output. If this was true, if these two things were just true generally about machine learning, we'd have no problems, right? Um, I, I, but unfortunately, that is not the case for modern machine learning systems. Now, I'm not saying that I've solved this here. This has been you know, decades of people trying to solve similar problems to this, but for a particular subtask, we've done pretty interesting things. So I mentioned it earlier, um, but I, I also want to bring up this notion of creativity. So what does it mean to be creative? Well, um, I'm going to mention or, or describe in this talk, the purpose of this talk, that it means two things. One is to generalize well from a few examples. So if you tell a child that this animal on the left is a dog, they should be able to figure out that the animal on the right is a dog too, even though they look very different from each other. And then you also want to be able to produce novel and valuable work in comparison to prior work. So for example, the uh, um, uh, invention of French fries from potatoes, if you remember with that story. Now, the problem with this is creativity is broad, subjective, and undefined. If I asked anybody here, what is creativity, they would almost certainly give me a different answer. Um, so for this purposes of this talk and in my work generally, I define creativity using the work of Margaret Bowden, which is that it is a series of cognitive processes that allow humans to solve problems, including design in ways that other humans consider creative. And it has three components parts, novelty, surprise, and value. These are the three important things. Now, this has been used in other machine learning work, like in Go Explore or in Novelty and Surprise Search. We're not going to be talking about that here. 
we're interested in a completely different thing, right? Let's, let's jump back to the problem. So in our problem, we can define this a little bit more. We're gonna to wanna to be in a situation where we have some amount of data for people for some target task. This is the equivalent of that second phase I was mentioning earlier. And with that, we're going to train some model. This is gonna be a deep neural network. From there, what we wanna do is approximate variations of this model, new models, which are making use of secondary information. In this case, the little, the little uh, uh, guy uh, from earlier, from our target individual, the individual we actually care about. And using that together, we're going to try to approximate a model for our target task. So just to make this explicit, right? We're going to assume that we have data from other people during this sort of second phase of their life. And we're gonna use that data to train a model. Then we are going to use data from a particular individual during the first phase of their life to be able to approximate new models, which are actually going to do a better job of modeling that individual during the second phase of their life, the thing we actually care about, but for which we have no data, that's the dashed line here. That's what that's indicating. So the question then becomes, how do we actually wanna approximate our target model? And this is why I brought creativity, because we're gonna use a particular kind of cognitive process linked to creativity called combinational creativity. So this is a general cognitive process, and I can prove to you that it's a general cognitive process right here and now. The simplest way to do this is to say, imagine an animal. If I say, imagine an animal, almost definitely the thing that happened in your head is you combine two existing animals together to produce some new animal, whether that's like a, a dog with wings or a, a lizard with, you know, whatever, <laughs> with, with, a, with a cat's tail. I don't know. I'm just making this up, right? Um, you can see where my head immediately went with two of the dog with wings. I don't know. But anyway, this is a cognitive process, which is general, which means that it's not just occurring if I ask you to invent an animal. It's actually occurring all the time in your head. So Margaret Bowden, as I mentioned before, uh, originally proposed it as one of three goals for AI creativity back in 1998. And Faconia and Turner proposed a most, the most popular current implementation called conceptual blending in 2008. This is a, a, co a, um, a computational uh, uh, implementation of this cognitive process. That, that might be a lot of words, but basically it's how do we take this process that we know exists in humans and represent it in computers? Uh, this is the book that Faconia and Turner originally produced. Uh, there's also, this is also called conceptual combination. Uh, for those of you in the psychology field, you might be more familiar with that. Our own Dr. Christina El Gagne here from the University of Alberta is an export, expert in this process. Um, but there's basically decades of evidence here to show that this process is a compact and efficient way to approximate combinations. Humans do this problem solving all the time. Why can't we use it for machines? So let me, let me get a little bit more specific in terms of what I mean by combinational creativity and sort of how this is gonna work in computers. So uh, if we have something like the two inputs on our left here, let's read this out. This is a resident that lives in a house on the land and a passenger that rides on the boat on the water. Then by combining these two inputs, we could approximate a brand new concept. In this case, a houseboat, a resident who is also a passenger, rides and lives in a houseboat on the water. So this is with the conceptual blending approach, which I mentioned from Baconia and Turner earlier. Now, traditionally, this approach has only been used for um, human author data like this, right? Where we have a set structure, which is very fixed. And because of that sort of similar structure, we can combine things together. So some of my earliest work way, way back in the day was looking at, can we combine machine learn models? And this is a, hopefully a fun example. Um, this is uh, a video game example. This is the game Super Mario Brothers, two different models for different kinds of levels from Super Mario Brothers. And the idea was, hey, could we take this conceptual blending approach and use it to combine this machine learned data? So what we did is we sort of approximate it into this sort of graph-based representation, which gets it closer to what you'd want as an input to a conceptual blending system. And then we combined it using conceptual blending and was able to use that to produce entirely new levels, new kinds of levels that had never been produced before. So for example, we could use machine learning and this notion of conceptual blending to produce never before seen content like underwater castles. So there's some problems with blending, as I mentioned, and it's gonna assume this well-formed, generally human author data. And that's not ideal when we're talking about machine learning, right? So for that, this is some of my thesis work from a, a few years ago, I developed this approach called conceptual expansion, which is this new combinational creativity function. I've got the sort of mathy version down here, but I also have a hopefully more intuitive version up here. The basic idea is that we're going to combine features, in this case, these sort of smiley faces or frowny faces or whatever face this is, along with some alpha filters. These are these sort of block next to them. 
And we're going to use these to figure out what information from the alpha filters, my cat is here now, uh, do we want to extract to be able to recombine it to approximate some new concept? So this is mathy, obviously, um, but the mathiness is actually a benefit to us in this case, because what we want is to work with messy, mathy machine learning knowledge. So for example, um, let's imagine that we have a problem, a new problem, different problem than the one that we've been talking about so far, and that's a new animal has been discovered. Now this new animal is kind of like a combination of say a cat and a dog, right? Um, and we might, you know, maybe it's a little bit rusted. It's got some cat features and uh, dog features. Maybe we think, oh, could we, could we combine the knowledge of cats and dogs to be able to approximate that new animal? And let's say we call this new animal a fox, for example. So in this work, what we did was we took deep neural networks, which if you're unfamiliar, this is the one slide where I'm gonna talk about them. This is not a lecture for introducing or a talk for introducing deep neural networks. But deep neural networks are basically the state of the art in image recognition, but they tend to require a large amount of data. But DNNs have a nice graph or matrix like knowledge representation, which matches the sort of smiley faced grid sort of representation I was showing you a second ago. So what we did was we used conceptual expansion on a deep neural network for image recognition in this case. So we had uh, cats and dogs, let's say, uh, and then we could recombine the knowledge on the cats and dogs to approximate new information, sort of pretending we had just discovered something entirely new, a new animal, like a fox, for example. Again, the basic way this would work is we would uh, train a image recognition neural network on cl these classes, airplane, automobile, bird, cat, deer, dog, etc. And then we would try to use conceptual expansion to approximate a new class, a new kind of animal that we're pretending we've never seen before that we don't have any knowledge of. Um, this is some work from Combinance Learning New Models via Recombination from IEEC, which is this big computational creativity conference. Basic results summary, uh, we tried out a number of different things of sort of introducing a, a new thing, a foxes, planes, pegasuses, and so including animals that just don't exist. Uh, we went from CIFAR 10 to CIFAR 100. These are just some, some image, um, image data sets. And in all cases, we beat out transfer learning and zero shot baselines, but roughly three to 30%, an average of 10%. So this suggests that this works, but how does that relate to the problem that we mentioned earlier, right? So, so here's the idea. Just as we were able to recombine knowledge about like cats and dogs and so on and so forth to be able to approximate some withheld class of foxes, so too can we combine knowledge from the person in the first phase of their life, other people in their secondary phase of life to be able to approximate a model of this target person on their secondary phase of life. That's the idea. So how does this work? So the approach itself is called a conceptual expansion MCTS or CEMCTS. It's the exact sort of problem formulation I showed you before, right? We're going to train uh, a model on uh, target task data, which is our secondary phase, the sort of old men data, but from other old men in this case. Then we're going to use the secondary task, which in this case is like the young man, that data, to be able to approximate a new model for the young man when he's an old man. That's the idea here, oh, cat hair all over the place. The second step of this, right, is that we're going to re-represent our initial model as a conceptual expansion. So as this sort of uh, representation where we're combining existing knowledge, that's the, gonna be the key for this approximation step. And then to search the sort of space defined by the set of combinations, we're going to be using this approach called MCTS. So we're gonna search this space according to the following heuristic. This is basically a way of combining a uh, uh, very granular representation of how we do on the sort of second phase, the old man phase, with a much, um, much more abstract representation of how we do during the young man phase. Then basically we're going to select the final model according to similarity to other individuals on the secondary task. So sort of find the most similar old men <laughs> to this person when they were young men and then use that to find the final model. So that's the idea. This, one's, this part's a little bit technical. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to try to keep it at a higher intu uh, intuition level. But let me sort of walk through these steps in a little bit more detail. So for the architecture, we're using a fairly simple four-layer LSTM. Um, this is a relatively small model, but I should have mentioned earlier, not only do we have no data for the secondary target test we care about, we also uh, have very little data overall. So we're talking about hundreds of data points as opposed to usually you'd be working with thousands of data points. So uh, this sort of smaller model is appropriate because of that. If you're not familiar, again, this is not a um, talk for introducing deep neural networks, but as an intuition, 
We're using LSTM because LSTMs are really good for dealing with sequential data. So if we have like sequences of events, right? And LSTM is really good for modeling that. And the basic reason for that is we have a series of LSTM cells that are sort of processing input in order. And we can basically hold on to uh, older input through something called a memory. Uh, this basic ability to sort of figure out longer term relationships with an LSTM. This is really key for this kind of, of modeling. And then generally LSTMs are useful in sort of financial modeling tasks. So the second step, right, was to re-represent our model as a conceptual expansion. So just as before we had the sort of um, smiley faces and these sort of big black boxes to tell us uh, how do we combine things together, right? Um, in this case, we're going to have uh, the equivalent of these big black boxes, but they are going to be for uh, individual neural network weights. So we're gonna have weights over here on our right side and these sort of alpha filters on our left side. And we're gonna have a number of ways of moving through the space, right? Whether that be multiplying pieces of our alpha filter, multiplying whole sections that are alpha filters, swap sections of our alpha filters and weights, and uh, um, add uh, alpha filters and weights. So this is basically like adding other parts into this combination, swapping the parts of the combination or changing the alpha filters, telling us what should we actually be grabbing from the neural network weight in question. So to search the CE space, what we're gonna do is we're gonna re-represent each uh, model represented as a conceptual expansion as a single node in a big tree. Uh, each of these nodes is gonna hold on to its uh, alpha filter values and its neural network weights. Uh, it's going to also have a fitness value. That's the formula I showed you earlier. It's going to have a reference to its parent node and to its child nodes. Basically, where did it came from? What was the, the model that it came from? And the child nodes are, are uh, when we make changes to this model, we refer to those as child nodes. Then we're going to use MCTS to search through the space. Uh, now, MCTS you might be fam more familiar with in terms of being used for automated game playing. For example, if you're familiar with AlphaGo. Um, but MCTS is a general method for sort of exploring large, potentially unbounded search spaces. Um, the basic idea is that at every step, we are going to uh, select from a current node the next node that we're going to explore. If we've never gotten to that node before, then we expand a sort of tree representation. It looks like this. We call these a tree if you're not familiar uh, in, in CS, but really they look more like upside down trees. Um, then simulation, so if we hit the, the final node of our sort of rollout, then we're gonna do what's called a simulation. In a simulation, we're basically going to uh, uh, figure out how good we think further models of this is gonna be. We're gonna be using our fitness function for that. And then finally, we have back propagation, where we're going to, to return the values back up to our root. So we repeat this a whole bunch of times, uh, and eventually the idea is that our models for particular nodes, or our values for particular nodes, are going to be pretty representative of how good that node is for our target task. That's the idea. Again, no data available for the target task. Uh, that's just the hope. So let's see how that works, right? Most important thing is the results. Before I can actually talk through the results directly, I'm gonna to need to talk about baselines. So um, the baselines that we had were all set up to use six GPU hours. Um, that's a fairly small amount of time, especially if you're familiar with more um, complex um, uh, approaches here, uh, which might end up taking a lot more time. But those also generally are larger models that you have more data. So we're keeping it at six GPU hours to be fair across the board. For many of these, you can go for a lot longer. So we have an aggregate approach. This can be thought of as like the naive approach. This is the typical way that you might try to solve this problem um, using machine learning. We're going to train on all of the old men <laughs> other than our target old man. And we're just gonna hope that the other old men, by training on all the other old men, we are going to end up with a final model, which is good enough that it can do a decent job of predicting the target old man. Uh, then we have our second task trained approach. This is a transfer learning approach, which is referred to as fine tuning. We're basically gonna take our second aggregate model and then fine tune on our second task data. So take the model trained on all the other old men and then retrain it for the young men. Now this is unlikely to work because the young men and the old men are actually statistically significantly different from one another. Then we have a random walk. So uh, this is a random walk 
uh, with the same final selection method. So we're just going to walk through the space of possible models. Then we have a CE random, which is the same as a random walk over CE in our conceptual expansion representation. Greedy, which is greedy optimization over the conceptual expansion representation. And then finally, beam, which is a single simple beam search over that conceptual expansion representation. So if we beat out these sort of top three, that's telling us that we're doing better than sort of naive uh, or other common approaches you would use to solve this problem. If we beat out the bottom ones, that's telling us that MCTS is really helpful here. So as a reminder, this is for the financial task. We have our young men that we actually know about. We have a whole bunch of old men who are not our target person. And then we're trying to approximate a model for this young man when he's an old man. Now, again, I just want to make clear, I'm, I'm using these descriptors of like young man, old man as a reference point. Um, but that is not uh, actually the task, right? Again, I can't tell you what the actual task is. Because the important thing is that the second phase is always before the first phase, and that there's a significant difference between the two, thus the illustrative example. So what we did is we took a whole bunch of data, uh, helpfully provided to us by Service Credit Union, and we ran what's called a five-fold uh, cross-fold uh, validation, which is that we split up our data five times, and each time used a fifth of it as test data or, and the others as training data. So we never had access to the test data during the runs. Uh, we only had access to the training data. So we have our five-fold results here and then our averages here. I know there's a lot of numbers. The important thing is the things in bold. So the things being in bold mean that CEMCTS across four of our five folds and on average beats out all the other methods. So it's beating out all of the other sort of naive approaches you might try to solve this problem. That's the top three here. These would be the standard ways you might try to solve this with machine learning. But it's also beating out, except in one case, all of our uh, other CE approaches, which means that MCTS really is the best way to search through the space. So that's all well and good, um, but the differences here are pretty minimal. So if you look on average, we have that CMCTS gives us 0 0.085. This is MSC loss. I should have said that earlier. Apologies. So we want this to be as low as possible. And that's only slightly lower than CE random on average, 0 0.088. Now, that's not exactly true because of the kinds of data that we're working with here. A very small difference in terms of the mean square error is actually really significant. So 0 0.003 actually can vary between uh, something like uh, a few dollars to up to thousands of dollars, depending on which individual we're modeling. So it can be very significant difference. That being said, what we also wanted to do is take a look at outliers. So these are the people who are uh, very different from the others. If you remember way back with the Christmas GAN example that looked a little bit funky, um, the idea here is that machine learning tends to do worse, modern machine learning tends to do worse on cases where we have high variability. So for outliers, these are the people who are, as the name suggests, towards the outside of the distribution. They're the, the people who don't quite fit in. So when we grab just those people from our training data um, for each fold, we get a significant improvement over our results. In all cases, CEMCTS is the best. And if we look here, we're at 0 0.02 roughly in terms of uh, an improvement over the, the um, the, uh, the closest baseline. Um, this is really indicative that, you know, uh, on outliers, especially, this approach is really, really good, uh, much better than anything else we have. Now, you might be saying, hey, CE random is random. Why is it doing consistently like better than basically anything else? That's not exactly true. It's close in this case to CE beam search. It's close over this case to CE beam search again between these two numbers. But the, the big thing that's going on here is that exploration for this problem is really important. Right? We want to look at as many things as possible, at as wide a range as possible. And CE random is really helpful for that because random just means that you wander around randomly. So you're going to see a lot of different stuff. But CMCTS is still the best. Um, the other thing that we wanted to try is, OK, well, we're doing better. But that's not actually telling if we're doing significantly different. So we also ran a series of statistical tests, in this case, t-tests, to see if our results, the CEMCTS, were significantly different from the other results. And at least once uh, for, for all the folds, right, we are significantly different from naive aggregate and CE greedy. Um, we're not significantly different uh, from uh, second task fine tune or random across the initial folds. 
We're not seeing anything different from CE random across the initial folds. But if we look at the outliers, we are significantly different from them there. So particularly on the outliers, not only is CE MCTS overall better, it's also making predictions that are significantly different from everything else except for CE greedy and CE beam search. Uh, but we're already in the conceptual expansion representation there. So we're getting models that are close, but they're not quite as good. That's sort of the indication here. We're way different than everything else, but when we use similar optimization approaches, we're just getting better models, better versions of the same models. So that's the idea. So just to prove out that this isn't um, nothing, that <laughs> this isn't just random, we also made use of this for a second task. This is a level design task. As you might have gotten from the earlier sort of Super Mario Brothers examples, uh, my background is actually in video game design. This is where this sort of all came from. Um, but obviously machine learning and stuff has come into it significantly. Uh, so this project was on a deep reinforcement learning uh, agent adaptation. So this was the interface where we had designers, published game designers working with a, a RL agent in the background. And we have these published designers work on two different kinds of levels. So one of them was above ground Super Mario Brothers levels and one of them was below ground Super Mario Brothers levels. These are very different as you can see from just the color palette, but also in terms of what shows up. So we have them design these two different kinds of levels. And the basic idea was, okay, well, this is sort of similar to that target task, right? Because if we have one of these kinds of levels, can we predict how they're gonna do on the other level? That's basically the idea. So we ran the exact same uh, study, but now swapping in this different task. And, what we, and we had fewer baselines in this case. And what we found is we still do significantly better. Now, I didn't go ahead and uh, split that out into different folds here because there was already a, a set train test split for this data set. And also notably, I don't spe specify out the outliers because this is a design problem. And so the outliers actually made up the majority of the distribution, which basically just means it's a very, very broad distribution. Um, that might sound like nothing, but basically what's going on here is we're showing that again, CEMCTS really is doing better than all the other approaches, including what was previously the best approach that we had, which is my own prior work, so it's nice to beat myself, um, uh, on this task by a, a very significant margin. Okay, so with that, I've actually hit the end here, and I've hit this a bit early. I talk fast, that's my bad. Um, so it gives us a lot of time for questions. Uh, before we get to that, I had a few sort of concluding remarks that I wanted to get through. So the first of these is, high level, right? What did we do? We presented a new zero shot transfer learning approach for behavior prediction tasks. We also found that we outperformed standard solutions to the problem or for our particular problem, I should say, um, for this task. So we're better than the sort of common practice in machine learning at the moment. We also found that we beat out other optimization methods. So using MCTS really does seem to be the best thing to do for this case. So if you have a problem that's exactly like this, where you have these two different phases, and when one phase you have no data, this really does seem to be the approach to use right now. Okay, um, with that, I'll go ahead and wind down about 30 minutes. It's only a little bit under. Uh, so I wanted to say a quick thank you, obviously, to the University of Alberta uh, for you know, giving me a job, uh, for Amy for making an Amy Fellow, uh, and the members of the Grail Lab for all the work they do. Um, thanks to my tax and Service Credit Union for funding this research and big thanks to Service Credit Union for supplying all this data and the problem. The research can't happen without problems to be supplied. Uh, if you have particular interesting research problems and, and data, I'd love to chat. Uh, but most of all, I'd like to thank Anmol for doing all of the work. Um, if he was not, you know, working full time now, I would happily have him doing this presentation instead. I want to uh, say again, like just how much this work is just on moles. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and, and there I have some extra slides just in case um, there's some other further questions that might be of interest and I'll go ahead and head back and we can start any questions that we have. Thanks so much. Glad you like the cat. Um, yeah. Uh, ah, sure. Yeah, no worries. Take your time. I sort of sped through that. <laughs> Just uh, wondering if uh, you guys have any questions to put it on the chat and uh, we'll ask uh, Matthew here. We'll just give the folks a few more minutes uh, to type up if they have anything. No worries. But yeah, that was a really, uh, really insightful uh, presentation. Thank you.
Graham Taylor uh, makes a comment. Uh, this reminds me a bit of synthetic controls often used to evaluate political uh, economic what ifs. Uh, are you familiar with that? I am not. Um, I would guess from the fact that it's called synthetic controls. Um, yeah, okay. I've now just, I've just quick gone to Wikipedia summary of this. <laughs> I, so what I often find is that there are lots of different approaches similar to this in lots of different domains, right? I, I mentioned already how uh, even combinational creativity is referred to in different names in different domains. Um, so it does seem to be a sort of attempt to approximate the future based on existing data. Um, uh, so I'd have to dig into it more, um, but I have to say that, you know, there's lots of approaches for doing similar things, right, for attempting to approximate the future based on existing data, but we're trying to do something a little bit different. We're trying to basically uh, approximate a distribution that does not exist or that we don't have data for, uh, which is slightly different. But again, I have to dig into it more. Okay. Um, he said the analogy for the closest old man is the closest behind blend of countries who did not implement policy. Um, and he's also adding, I've always been fascinated by this technique. Anyways, sorry, it's not meant to be. <laughs> did you try approach Z question? Yeah, so it's, you know, I, I think that from what you're saying, then it sounds like it's a bit like K nearest neighbors. Um, uh, which is not a not quite what we were doing, right? What we were doing is we're basically it'd be closer in in your use case to saying something like, um, "What if we used uh, a sort of a signal of similar situations in these other countries to uh, search a space of possible explanations for what might happen in a particular target country?" Uh, I don't know if that makes sense exactly, but there, there's a, a distinction between saying we think you're going to do what's similar to countries that are similar to you are doing and saying that we're actually going to be using uh, sort of feedback almost uh, or the differences in our predictions from these other countries to give us a signal to say, where do we look for saying what you might be doing? Okay, good to know. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions in the chat here. Graham Teller says, thanks. But uh, yeah, I'd be happy to happy to discuss it more with you later, Graham. But uh, yeah, I'd be happy to happy to discuss it more with you later, Graham. All right. Uh, seems that there may not be any more questions. But uh, would you be able to let us know where people can reach you as well? Be any more questions? But uh, would you be able to let us know where people can reach you as well? Of course, yeah. So I had my email briefly up on that last slide, uh, but it's just guzdial my last name. Uh, at uAlberta.ca. Thank you Excellent. much. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you, Laura. And I just want to chime in. Sorry, my internet was cut out there, but uh, uh, Matt, the other thing is that if you go on the sessions tab on the on the right, you, and you go into the chat, you can see some of the links that uh, the Graham had posted there. But yeah. um, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. And and Matt, I hope the audience, the folks tuning in. Um, can learn more about you, learn more about the work that's taking place at Amy. I know it's, it's fantastic across our audience. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to congratulate you for, for all the, the great work, uh, the students that you have under your wing. It's, it's really fun to see and it's really interesting to see. So thank okay. you for taking the time to, to share with us today. Happy to. All right. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.